Hello, again. Okay. I just think it's really funny when you smack it. It really makes me laugh a lot. So I was supposed to talk about navigating Buddy Press's identity crisis, but we talked about that already sort of this morning. So, what do you want to do? In Buddy Press. So, it's funny you mention that. Uh, there are two people that are actively pursuing this. Bronson Quick and Ryan Futke. Uh, Ryan has, uh, works at Web Dev Studios, has been like on a REST API for BuddyPress for years at this point. Uh, he has some scaffolding on GitHub to just like block out endpoints, but nothing, maybe activity streams, he had, kinda has some stuff in there. Um, my direction for them is to just figure it out. I mean, it's kind of a terrible direction, but it's, it, there is so much that has to happen, and a lot of the functionality that's in BuddyPress today is largely criticized as being inspired by what you see in the theme versus what data you might actually want out of the functions themselves. So if we need, and we will eventually have to have some sort of RESTful API in it, but what that looks like and how we choose to expose that data is currently not dependent on anything, right? So it was easy when we were building BuddyPress to say, okay, well, when you're viewing a profile, what do we need to get out of the database? We need groups of fields and fields. Pretty simple, so you have a schema, the database, you map out what an object looks like, you create your CRUD methods to interact with it, pretty simple. But when you're publicly exposing that data to a, an endpoint that is meant to just be spammed, basically get, get whatever you want from it, is different. So uh, the logical thing would be to take the functionality that we have and just one-to-one -one map it over. And that might be where they start, uh, because it's easy. It gets us someplace, because we are no place right now, so I we can experiment. And the other part of it is uh, largely how do our current users actually interact with a BuddyPress installation, and it isn't generally with some sort of single page, front-facing, you know, React-based application, it's WordPress themes, or BuddyPress themes, WordPress themes that have BuddyPress support are already complex enough without introducing an additional abstraction layer of requesting data for every point that you might need it to or from. So it is a lot of work. And uh, we have so far avoided doing that work. But, if you want to do that work or help us figure out what that work might practically look like in reality, uh, now is an awesome time to come in and heavily influence the direction that those things should go. We spent a lot of time looking at what, a, what everyone else is doing. Facebook, Twitter, Path, every weird social network and what Object GitHub, what, what things look like and what you get back out of them. And uh, it is an interesting case study to see just how much or little is exposed uh, publicly and how, what those switches look like even in a settings screen for something like GitHub where you've got private repos and you've got, you can get, you can't really get repos for a user, but you can loop through and like get a bunch of stuff, but not everything. How do you really truly calculate and expose that data? And the same goes with profile fields, visibility, groups that you are a member of, groups that you have requested membership to. Should I be able to see the groups that you have requested access to or not? I mean, right now I can't, but if I can grab your endpoint and I am not logged in as you, 
we have to make a bunch of decisions about what it is that we have actual access to. In WordPress, this ends up being mostly flat because you have very blog-based, post-based roles. And the concept of a private post or post visibility does not really totally exist. We have post status, but that isn't post visibility. It, we have the status of publish, draft. We have private, but status and visibility are kind of two different things. I could have a draft post that should be private, but WordPress doesn't have a column for post visibility. So how do we take what we know isn't necessarily right in WordPress or could be better and then map a lot of those decisions to public and openly available RESTful endpoints in BuddyPress? There's just a lot to do. And it, we, I don't want to call what we did with early days or with BuddyPress's code missteps. I mean, we made like lots of happy accidents that worked out really well. Uh, for example, uh, most of BuddyPress's core components, code-wise, uh, started off as objects. They were all very object-oriented approaches towards activity streams, individual activity posts. Uh, loops that you would get were already loops of objects that were individual activity stream items. Uh, for scalability of reasons, rather than just have one flat post parent column, we use MPTT so we can sort of get the breadth of an infinite depth of activity stream items. So unlike with comments where you have to nest your replies like 10 deep and then it starts to scale really terribly, we can sort of scale infinitely until we have to recalculate the whole tree, doesn't matter, <coughs> ignore that. But uh, we have some other funny considerations when it comes to REST API. Um, that are not unique to BuddyPress, but they are far and above unique in the WordPress world. Think of, um, I, I, we all hate on Facebook. I think we shouldn't, because they are a team of engineers that do really awesome stuff and open source a bunch of stuff, and they are built on a similar platform that we are built on. See, when you consider PHP, largely MySQL, trying to do elaborate intersections with users and friends and friends of friends, and maybe their profile's private, and maybe they're, they have it locked down, and maybe they don't. Maybe they were in a group, and they posted in a group once, so you can see some stuff, but not others. And like, how long ago did they request your friendship? But did you deny it? But now you can see some of it, but then their photos are public and private. Like, the intersection of objects and privacy is huge, it is an enormous graph. And we can criticize them for privacy concerns and for messing it up and for making it really complicated, but it is complicated. And they do a decent job of boiling all of that down into a way that doesn't openly expose everyone's, I mean millions and billions of people's photos and information just openly to the web. So that's really why BuddyPress has skipped privacy completely. Because it's just, it, it's intimidating. It is a large amount of things to figure out. And so it's a cart, cart before the horse before the cart. Do we build RESTful endpoints and then build privacy on that? Or do we build privacy and build RESTful on top? Like which, which, which one would we want first and why? And a long time ago actually, an old contributor uh, we did, we just, I just refreshed the about page on buddypress.org. So the about page used to just be about buddypress. Like we're, we're a plugin for WordPress, deedly deedly dee. And uh, so we added the column on the far edge uh, to sort of outline who is behind the project itself. And uh, the, sort of our alumni developers uh, that we've added here, Andy Peetling being sort of the lead original project lead engineer, uh, went on to work at Automatic, works on WordPress.com, responsible for a large portion of Calypso that they open sourced and everything. Uh, Peetling's brilliant, super good guy. Uh, but Jeff Sayer uh, wrote a plugin, a very complex BP privacy plugin that would have been the alternative for BuddyPress Core if it was going to be the thing that we would roll in for privacy. And that was five years ago. 
and just to a point where is this a thing that everybody press installation should have? Uh, not really. Is it a thing that the majority will want? We have friends in here and the majority of people don't want it. So is privacy in there as like the next possible thing? Sure, I mean, that code is still there. It's still good. There's nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't the direction that we took back then. And so that code is still out there. Jeff is still cool. And uh, even though he has moved on to other cool things, that would be a potential thing. Uh, Bert Adsit even, uh, haven't really talked or thought about Bert much in a long time, but he uh, really in the early days before BuddyPress was ever single site, before WordPress had the big merge between multi-site and single site, he did a ton of just bizarre BuddyPress experiments with like taxonomy tables and global shared meta and like just things that would have enabled things like privacy to be a little bit easier for us. Uh, and to this day, we still have a ton of uh, like pre-existing code and experiments that we can learn from when it comes time to implement something that would be restful. Uh, I was talking a little bit about it at lunch where um, the thing that is fascinating to me about a REST API with BuddyPress specifically is it would end up exposing a lot more of the simplistic or sort of application-ness of BuddyPress where right now plugins and themes, they are, they are part of WordPress. PHP just includes that file and you are on the metal with the rest of WordPress. You are intertwined into actions and filters. But on a REST API, you have an endpoint, WordPress sort of loads it up, spools itself up, it pulls in what it needs to, and then you're responsible for handling that endpoint on your own. WordPress is gonna handle its own for core objects like posts and users and taxonomies and stuff. But for BuddyPress data, our endpoint is literally, okay, well now that you're here, how are we grabbing our own content from our own database tables in our own way to then spit that back out to a user? So rather than it being this integration deeply with a theme or with WP admin and looping into meta boxes and trying to display things and escape it and sanitize it and all this stuff that you're used to doing with WP admin and working in that one interface, there's literally now almost a separate application that just happens to hover on top of WordPress's endpoint registration system. So from that aspect, uh, because we have an almost unlimited number of directions that we can go with that data, uh, we are playing with it. It's the best non-answer that I can give, I guess. Does anybody want to help? Is that a thing that anyone in the room currently, like super is on point and cares about, that we can have beers? I got nothing but time. Um, but it would be cool. It would be super cool. We, uh, when we were building the first mobile version of Flux, build everything piecemeal. It was all of the restful endpoints that we have were, again, they were so closely coupled to what the theme at the time needed that it, it was a learning experience about just how many endpoints that we would need to have in order to get activity stream items, pull to refresh to only get deltas on updates to figure out what, your, what the range is that you might need for an activity stream, whether or not you want children, whether or not you want how many levels deep worth of children in an activity stream item. Do you want likes and favorites? You need user data for each one of those things because you have to get avatars for them, user IDs, which means you have to go out and get every user. It's like you end up doing 50 RESTful requests to get user and user and user and user or whatever that the payloads are so bizarre uh, that it was okay, well, we have, we have confirmed that this is going to be as gnarly as we expected for it to be. And hence we will use what we have in a private way and then keep, continue to learn what we can uh, and try to apply that to uh, what will eventually be in BuddyPress core. BBPress on the other hand will just largely inherit what we get from custom post types and taxonomies. Because BBPress's topics and replies are posts 
and forums are currently posts, but they will not be for much longer. They will be a taxonomy. Um, they were. They should have always been that way. It'll be all of the code. I know this. I know because I wrote it. It like is a thing that I get excited about because no one else really knows. But all of the forum code that is in the current version of the BB Press plugin is designed to be gutted out and replaced by taxonomies. Uh, because a lot of what's in there is a terrible compromise of like a post type on top of a post type hierarchy to walk a tree that doesn't really exist. It's really terrible. Knowing that taxonomy meta was going to come and save the day eventually. And so now that it has landed in, in WordPress core, we can take all of that heart for forums out and make forums a taxonomy for topics and replies. And then we can count topics and replies easier because we know what forum that they belong in, whereas we didn't previously and we had to crawl this, it was terrible. So BBPress will get cool updates eventually. Um, and then the restful endpoints will just be what custom post type endpoints that WordPress provides. The BuddyPress is more, more difficult. Sure. Yep. Um, funny that you ask that, actually. So because it is inside of WordPress, we largely use the tools that every other person would use to do any type of look up on queries or performance or cache hits or misses. Um, the debug bar plugin does a really good job of giving you a UI. Uh, I think um, there's a query monitor plugin. There is a specific plugin that we'll use just, just to uh, give us a convenient UI for what database queries are actually happening and did this actually hit the cache or is it any better? Some things, uh, like anything else, we weigh the pros and cons. Um, we will introduce things for WordPress, for parity with WordPress, like meta queries or like loose taxonomy queries where we know they're going to kind of be crappy queries, but we want that parity for that object. Um, and then the, um, the most popular caching plugins, uh, and I'm thinking like the memcache plugin by Civil and Ryan Boren, uh, WP Supercache, Batcache for full page output. Um, the Batcache part of it, we, uh, we largely avoid because most users are logged in, so you're not getting cached full page output. Uh, we have talked about and implemented some little optimizations in terms of just functionality to allow for uh, fragment caching to a certain degree, but we don't have our fragments in a way that really makes it work. All of our template parts still include so much time-based markup. 30 seconds ago, five minutes ago, someone requested you as a friend. Well, you can't cache that output because five minutes ago is 10 minutes ago now, so it doesn't work. Uh, but we do have functions for essentially shoving it in a big output buffer and then giving you the option to cache that buffer and then putting it in place with a unique key if you want. Uh, but um, there is, or what uh, came in, a potential security vulnerability, not necessarily with BuddyPress, but with an incompatibility with a caching plugin. And that dove me very, very deep into uh, several caching plugins, very popular ones, to figure out what do their object cache drop-ins look like, uh, what are they caching, how are they caching it, when are they caching it, and then how is BuddyPress sitting on top of it and making sure that everything is going okay. And in that digging deep, uh, really out of necessity, uh, looked into building a tool to try and give me some of that data back out. And so last week, uh, I published the results of that, which is a plugin called WP Spider Cache. 
And so this plugin, not really too unique, is um, largely based on one, a fork of bat cache, some weird little buddy press specific optimizations and stuff for what that output might look like, uh, some filtering of unique keys with BP underscore prefixes so that we can put buddy press cached objects in their own buckets <laughs> to make them easier to expire later or flush. And then uh, another drop in for uh, object caching that's based largely on board and civils memcache drop in. Uh, a lot of the memcache specific stuff ended up getting stripped out so that you could potentially drop in Redis or whatever else. Uh, but none of that really is all that useful if you can't see what's in the cache. And that's always really the problem that I have, maybe just because I, uh, I like to, the world is through and through, I need to touch it so I can see that it exists. And uh, when you can't see what's, you can't, you can't verify that something is in the cache, like I can't see the cache and talk to memcache and get out what's in there, it makes it very hard to validate that what's in the cache is true to the database or that there, something isn't polluted or out of sync. And then to be able to identify that this query has occurred and it actually did populate the cache when I wanted it to, and that when an update happens, it flushes it correctly and spits the right result back out. So the, a lot of it in the code is very straightforward. You, we know when to flush a cache. We know when to write to the cache because we know that these operations are just, they are occurring. This is the place where that needs to happen. But uh, Scott Taylor, who is the WordPress 4.4 release lead, years ago wrote uh, the foundation of a plugin called Johnny Cash. Uh -huh, you know. uh, and it was a very basic UI for memcached. And it didn't really look very WordPressy, didn't really sort of fit in where it needed to fit. And so with a little bit of polish and a little bit of buddy press on top of it to make sure that it would kind of look and feel the part, uh, Spider Cache comes with a fork of Johnny Cash's UI to talk and see directly back and forth with, uh, with memcache. So I hesitate to try and do a live demo right now, but you know, if we were gonna try, we may as well. I'll try and maybe ramp this back up. Doing it live, here we go. So what you get is just a list of whatever memcache servers you have registered. Of course, you can have many or several. Um, remote, local, whatever you've got. And then uh, what you'll get is everything that is in memcached. So if we were going to say, okay, give me what's in BuddyPress. Here is Buddy Press's cached objects and groups. So from here, we can say, okay, show me what's in this. It's gonna probably die, but some stuff hopefully will work. No, we'll see. Live demo is probably broken. But uh, at least you get an idea of uh, what our cache groups are, what our unique keys are, and then which component, what it all is. And without I feel like without an interface to see the cache. It's one thing for me to, to, to query a page and then see what cache is hit and miss. That's informative on a page load. But if I want to validate that I got this stuff and I put it in that bucket, I want to look in the bucket and see that it's in there, right? Like, so without a UI, I think it, you're, you're caching stuff blindly. And so the forks of three things come together, make one plugin, put it out and call it a thing. Uh, this, I think, was, is really instrumental in uh, not necessarily doing what I think is the popular and obvious thing, which is writing a bunch of automated tests to put it in the cache, check the cache, whatever else. For that, we're just doing what everybody else does, but a bunch of PHP unit tests that all just get dumped and ran, and then you know, hopefully they pass, right? Uh, but this gives real world, while we're developing, while we're building something, touch and feel uh, without needing to necessarily write the test, validate a test, write the code, 
make sure the code works. Did it? Is it in there? Run the test suite again. That takes a while. Break it all. Put it. Put it all. Break it all down. I just. I can just. I just want to see it. Give me. Give me something to look at. Um, this plugin isn't BuddyPress specific. It works really well with uh, essentially like everything. Uh, I don't know why everything is erroring right now because that's just the nature of live demonstrations, I guess. But um, yeah, that's terrible. I don't know why that is. Okay, so that's working. So blog details works. Um, it's not very pretty, right? It's just a dumb text area with the contents of a memcache key value store, but um, you get an idea of what ended up helping us to be able to see some of that stuff. Um, for us, the caching improvements were um, they're easier to add because they largely didn't exist. Like, we didn't cache a bunch of stuff. We we didn't cache friends or groups or activities. We just go get it. You're logged in. They're logged in, probably, or they were at some point. The data, you're going to want something as close to live as possible anyways. So for a lot of it, there's nothing to cache. Give me what, you, give me what is in there, and, I, and that's it. Uh, so now we have strategically looked at objects and queries and when we can flush what's in there a little bit more. Um, accurately. Because we had built all of these things as objects, then all the CRUD actions are the places where we can put all of the cache purges and gets and deletes. So, yep, easy, easy to do because it, it's not like we were making it, we weren't making the caching better, we were just adding it finally. I know some of this stuff too uh, was pretty heavily dependent on um, some multi-site improvements to WordPress. Um, a long time ago, we made the decision to um, maybe let me take a step back because BuddyPress can run in so many different environments and installation types. It might be multi-site. If it's multi-site, it might be in an MU plugins folder, which means it's always included. It might be uh, in your plugins folder and network activated, but you might have multiple networks that it could be activated on or not. In that case, is it running globally on the entire installation, meaning the database tables are global database tables, like multi-site global like database tables would be, or is it running on a site or a series of sites where those tables are not global? There's like all of these permutations. And uh, originally, we stored all of our configuration settings in WP Site Meta because it was supposed to be multi site only and it, they were going to be site options. And then when the merge happened, WP site meta or like WP add, what is it? WP get site meta, get update site meta. If you're a single site but you call get site meta, it'll still work, but it'll default to the only site that you have. So you can call get site meta on a single site install and it will still work. So then I was like, okay, well, we can, if you're single site and BuddyPress is installed, then we'll store this, the data in the root blog of the installation because what if you switch from single site to multi-site? We're not going to migrate all the data to... I was like, this is so stupid. <laughs> it's like, it's impossible to try and navigate how this works. So we uh, actively decided to move and migrate all of our site options into the root blog or the main primary blog of a multi-site install. So regardless of what site on a multi-site installation that you're on, BuddyPress switches to blog ID one or whatever the primary define is, gets BuddyPress's options out of the cache or ob out of the object cache, and then switches back to whatever site that you're on and continues doing whatever it's doing. So we had to wait for a bunch of caching improvements to switch to blog before we could really go down that road of storing options that way. Because otherwise, every time you'd switch from site to site to site, 
WordPress would query the database directly with a completely uncached query to the blogs table to get blog lookup data to then get the meta so that it knew what site to switch to. So if we wanted to switch three or four times, uncache query, uncache query, uncache query. And there was a while, well, while we were doing it, BuddyPress is like a thousand queries. Like, <laughs> WordPress.org's freaking out because we're trying to, you know, make it work right. And then it helps identify these little places where WordPress uh, can, can get better. So, uh, like along the same lines of where we're talking about um, the idea of using custom post types for stuff. And even I, like David's example for Conferencia, which I know he likes to like talk down about like it's not cool, but it is pretty cool. Uh, all of him, like all of his like pulling in tweets pulling in photos, storing them in like extra invisible sites all over the place. That's exactly what we would have done for BuddyPress Core. If we were gonna have custom post types, shove it somewhere, just put it in a site. Make sure that those database tables are going, they're only doing one thing. They're there for groups. Every time you wanna get a group, switch to blog, groups, get your group, switch back. Not that expensive anymore. Uh, so what David's doing with just using WordPress sites for arbitrary data storage is exactly what we had talked about. The, uh, and and I, I talk about it probably more than I should, but that's similar to the way that Jetpack works. Jetpack stores a copy of your site on WordPress.com, just in a different site, so you never see it. That's how it knows where your comments and posts and stuff are. Like it's the easiest way to just pipes your content back up into the cloud, into WordPress.com's big cloud of servers so it can serve your content for you. It's not grabbing your post from your site every time it shows up in someone else's dashboard. It's pulling it from the place that it can. It caches your posts locally so it can just deliver them more quickly. So we could eventually see BuddyPress broken up in a long enough timeline, right, into components that store data in different sites and switch around to get that data in uh, optimized ways. So, trying to think of anything else that might be neat. Sure. Sure. So, uh, I touched briefly on it, or at least joked about it earlier, where um, the in order to do that, we need a REST API. But more and more JavaScript goes into the theme side stuff in every iteration of BuddyPress's template pack, the default templates that are in there largely because it is an expectation of users to have things happen without the page refreshing. When it comes down to JavaScript deeply or integrating or using it more, for us today, it mostly just means a hybrid style theme. It means uh, a theme that you are rolling your own RESTful endpoints or you're rolling your own Ajax endpoints Maybe you're using Mustache or React or Angular or Framework 7 or any Ionic, any of the other popular things. Uh, but you're still digging into PHP. You're still writing something to get you the data that you need to get that list of activity streams or users or whatever. And then you're ducking back out with a template part to spit it back out on the page. Um, that's what that means today. Uh, it should be better, I guess. I'm. I'm old school, so if you, if you want me to separate my personal opinion from the direction that I think BuddyPress should go, sometimes those are two different answers. Uh, because, and I guess I've got time, right? When are you up? 15 minutes? She's at the top of the hour. Okay, good. I've got, more or less, more or less. I've got, I've got 10 minutes for a rant then. Ooh, you going on a rant? Yeah, uh-oh. So, <laughs> Here, here, here is my problem with this, is if this has a name, someone tell me. If it doesn't, we should give it one today. Because like 
every time, like my Apple TV is terrible with this, with Netflix, with the Photos app, with the Music app, with the, with the Movies app, every app at one point had made a RESTful request out, got something, and then cached it locally on the Apple TV. I will switch out of Netflix and go to Music. It will show me the cached version that is locally of whatever images that were there. I can still interact with the interface. I can scroll up to go view my photos. <laughs> new photos show up because it made another fresh request and shows me the new content. That sucks. It is terrible. It does it for every app. It does it on the Xbox One, the same exact thing. It shows up stuff out of the feed. You load up a video game. It shows you kind of the screenshot from where it thought it cached a screenshot from before. And then you actually go to play the game, and boop, it's in a different screen in a different place. And you're like, you can still navigate it, and all of a sudden the console refreshes. It makes another request out, and you're out of your game, and you're in a different place. Why is it like that? I know why it's like that, but it's a terrible experience. Facebook is like... You go to search in the Facebook mobile app, you search, it types down, you type somebody's name or whatever you're searching for, the group, it shows some results right away that you had searched for last time that were cached, and then the second you go to tap it, here pop up some new results, and you tap the wrong thing every single time. And it's because we are building everything in a restful way that caches these results locally so that they're speedy, but then your experience of actually using it is terrible all the time. We used to call it with fonts. What was the font one where fonts would take a second to load? The like, the flash of one, yeah, right? We have that with REST, with like every RESTful app. That's what happens. And with a hybrid sort of solution or like an even native apps are usually terrible at it. But the way that we use the web, maybe, maybe whether or not it's right or wrong, we are used to something hap like you click it and then maybe you get some crappy chunky load but you're waiting for that result to happen john has his hand raised but i'm going to end my rant first and then it'll be your turn flash of old data, flash of old data. food i love it food I, I flash of old data file this <laughs> that's also good for, for food flash of what was it flash of old data that's good because it's, uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a pandemic across every single iOS or Android app that you interact with. And it's, it, it, like, the more data that there is, is the worse that it gets. If it's your music library, if it's a photo library, like Apple Photos, for me, I've got 5,000 or something photos and like the photos in the cloud thing that it is. Not terrible, except for on the Apple TV. Apple TV, it like has like some photos but not others and it's like it's random totally random so my fear in whatever it is that we build for a restful endpoints or for whatever a buddy press specific style mobile experience might look like is not having that problem and i don't because i can't imagine a restful solution to that problem i i personally not the buddy press project as a whole but i have a hard time really being 100% committed to like investing the time to build out RESTful endpoints to make these the middleware possible, to make the separation possible, uh, because I don't see a positive outcome that I would want to use. And the outcome that I want to use, because I'm, you know, getting getting older every day, I I kind of don't mind the hybrid app model of like go out to a server get the output that I want, get, get cache, query, whatever you want to do, give me the part fully rendered that I'm working with, and then plug that into the place where it belongs. Because that's what we expect, that's we, you, you know, we're used to tangible remotes with buttons on them. If that button disappeared, it's like having a bowl of soup or cereal, and every time you dig your spoon in to get a lucky charm, the lucky charm's on the other side of the bowl. And every once in a while, you go to take a spoonful, and the bowl moves three feet over, and you don't know why. What, this is what we have worked towards. We have invested, like, man hours, technology, like, the best developers in the world are working towards that. I think it's terrible. So that's my rant about what to do with that. 
So in our experience, it's okay. In, in our experience of testing BuddyPress on PHP 7, it is okay. Uh, we haven't, it is okay because WordPress is okay. If WordPress wasn't okay, BuddyPress would not be okay because of the whole MySQL deprecation thing. Um, we don't do anything real fancy in BuddyPress in terms of database queries or anything that might break outside of like WordPress's anticipated norms. Um, so we're okay. I know that uh, the WP Engine folks have had some issues with it, but I don't know exactly what those are. So live stream, phone a friend, I guess let me know if I can help or what that is. Um, John has his hand up, so that's helpful. Right. Yeah. And so that, it, so for the live stream, uh, no memcached extension for PHP 7. So what that means is any persistent objects that wouldn't have changed that you can save the load of having to go out and get, you no longer get to save the load and you have to go out and get every time. And so for BuddyPress is a big deal because let's say you have an activity stream of 100 users that have posted and commented and if you can cache all of those 100 users because they haven't logged in recently, cache them, throw them somewhere, never get them again. When you have to get them every single page load, you know, everything is gonna spike. And BuddyPress is a funny, it is, it is an anomaly in the WordPress world because everyone, for largely, stereotyping, but uh, is used to dealing with heavily cached WordPress pages and posts. Comments would be the thing that like screws up everybody's world occasionally, but we all hate comments now, so that doesn't even really matter. <laughs> when, you were, when you're used to living in a world where you can dodge WordPress entirely, render the content, throw it in varnish, and never touch WordPress for that pay, post or page again, is a different world than what you live in with BuddyPress or with logged in users. You log in and now you're not caching anything. So when all of your users aren't logged in, or all of your users are logged in, your caching strategy is 100% totally different. So object caching is a requirement. Uh, and persistent object caching would be, a, would be a, almost a requirement for most BuddyPress sites. And so without that, you're, you're waiting or you're using something else. Am I wrong? Is my rant totally wrong? I feel like I'm vulnerable right now, like a live stream in a room of people. I know. I know. Sure. For, oh, oh. Again, I guess I'm I'm sort of old school. I I have a tendency to just go as straight as close to, yeah as close to my SQL as you can go. Anything else is for. Like is for convenience sake, is to give you something pretty and a place to feel more comfortable about it, uh, but I would just dump it. It's the same thing with like writing migration scripts and stuff. Like I get that like crawling websites and everything else is like fun and exciting and you get to do and learn and do neat things. But even BB Press's forum converter, uh, so Stephen Edgar largely built the current version of the converter and maintains it to this day, but BB Press 2 uh, comes with like a really sweet converter tool for almost every type of actively developed forum database schema. And rather than it be this like, go out and make all these requests to get data from endpoints and then pull them in and port them over to posts table and stuff, the whole technique is if this is your forum and you have ownership of the data, get the database tables on the same server, just run the queries and convert the data because it's your data and it will be fast and it will work very well and we can recreate indexes and stuff on the fly so that write queries aren't slow and we can prevent lock tables and everything. Like the tables are just gonna be where it's going to be the fastest. I also like how like, who here has heard like Apple, like Apple Metal? 
right? So like their whole thing last year of like this whole metal, like running close to architecture and making everything fast and stuff. It's like, you don't write more code and more abstraction to make something faster. It's just another toll booth in the way to get where you're trying to go. The only way to make it faster and get closer to the metal is to work closer to the metal. So the closest that you can get to, to the database for dumping that stuff is the best you can do. You end up very traditional, though, master-slave type stuff so that you can copy stuff without locking stuff, copies that are already relatively live, maybe trying to have deltas so that you can keep something up to date. If once it gets big enough, you're going to end up probably doing backups off of a copy of master so that your actual master isn't going to be in the way and get locked. Um, nothing that I think would be anything unique to WordPress or BuddyPress specifically. It's relatively standard MySQL optimization backup stuff. Probably not the answer you're looking for. There are, awesome, there are, like, there are like tons of awesome, awesome WordPress companies that only backup buddy iThemes guys have incredible stuff. There are awesome tools to do it. Eventually, though, you just have too much data. And you got to do it the old school way. These are good questions. I appreciate these. This is fun. And I guess, I don't know, how are we on time? I got one minute, but, uh, you know. Yeah, so we were thinking about trying to do a Google Hangout and see who of the BuddyPress core development team we can get all in a Hangout at the, at the same time. And so if you want to do your talk then soon, and then I can see who I can wrangle. Um, yeah. So I am also not on the Wi-Fi, and I don't know if the Wi-Fi here is any better or worse. I'm just tethered to my iPad. So, okay. So th that might be my thought, is we'll use a machine that we know has been tried and true on the Wi-Fi to try and make that work. Any other questions? Anything else? Anything I can help with or do or solve or say? or uh, I can be. Sure. That's fine. Cool. All right. And even if I'm just floating around, then just grab me and we'll, yeah, that's fine too. You're welcome. Sure. <laughs> we actually have over uh, 330 people on our podcast. That's awesome. Did that happen, really? Oh, sure. So I never, I've never had 300 people, 330 